about the close of the year 1834, there were to be found in Charleston, New Orleans, and some other southern cities, a few politicians who earnestly desired the re-establishment of the African slave trade and the acquisition of slave territory. These men formed clubs called the SRCs, they had signs of recognition, by which they made themselves known. In the year 1852, the SRCs had become more numerous, and their organization was more highly perfected. In 1855, it was noticed that the anti-slavery sentiment in the North was growing still stronger. It was about this time that a certain George C. Bickley, who was a native of Boone County, Indiana, but, at the period alluded to, resided in Cincinnati. Having espoused the causes of the SRCs, took it in hand to reduce them to a more perfect state of organization. He christened it with the highly chivalrous name of Knights of the Golden Circle. The several divisions of the KGC, according to the new constitution, were called castles. As in the case of most other secret orders, there were subordinate castles, and the Grand Castle, State Castle, or Legion. The officers of the subordinate castle consisted of a captain, lieutenant, secretary, treasurer, guard, for the inner door, sentinel, for the outer door, a corresponding secretary, and conductor. The officers of the Grand Castle were the same as those of the subordinates, with the addition of the prefix Grand. Their new constitution set forth in its first article, as one of its principal objects of the order, the acquisition of Cuba, Mexico, and Nicaragua. In another article, opposition to the encroachment of abolitionism. The KGZ's plan for the 1860 election was to do everything they could to get Lincoln elected. The Knights caused agitation in the North, so that the North would despise the South and Abe Lincoln would more than likely be elected. So, the KGC put out a flood of rumors about Lincoln in the South. Mr. Lincoln was generally believed to be a totally illiterate numbskull, as barbarous toward the slaveholders as a hot ten tot. The KGC wanted Abe in the presidency because they could say he would abolish slavery and tread on southern rights, and then they could have their war. But, Abe wanted to do neither, as we shall see, there was no compromise to be had, no saving the Union, too much effort was put into the war, and moving forward was the only option. But, Lincoln, representing the Republicans, held that slavery is wrong, to be tolerated in the states where it exists, but which must be excluded from the territories, which are all normally free and must be kept free by congressional legislation, if necessary, and that neither Congress, nor the territorial legislature, nor any individual, has power to give to it legal existence in such territories. So, Lincoln was going to tolerate slavery in the territories where it existed, but the rumors about Lincoln in the South labeled him an out-and-out -out abolitionist. The Knights continued with their plan, for secession, and war. In short, every species of taunt and insult were to be used in order to arouse and irritate the North, so that Mr. Lincoln's election might be all the more certain. Another reason the KGC needed Lincoln in the presidency, was because Stephen A. Douglas, who was second to Lincoln in the popularity vote, did not fit in with their plans. In the South, the democracy was almost a unit in opposition to Douglas, holding, as they did, that, Douglas Free Soilism, was, far more dangerous to the South than the election of Lincoln, because it seeks to create a Free Soil Party there, while, if Lincoln triumphs, the result cannot fail to be a South united in her own defense. On the 25th of October, 1860, in Augusta, South Carolina, the governor, William Henry Gist, the congressional delegation, and other leading South Carolinians, met and decided that in the event of Mr. Lincoln's election, that state would secede. On Tuesday, November the 6th, 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected 16th President of the United States. Lincoln won entirely on Northern support. He was not on the ballot in 10 Southern states, and won only two of 996 counties in all the voting Southern states. 
South Carolina rejoiced over the election of Lincoln with bonfires and processions. It now seemed that the grand object for which the Knights had labored so earnestly was about to be attained. On December the 17th, 1860, in Columbia, South Carolina, the South Carolina Convention met. The next day, and following days, it met there, at Secession Hall, listening to stimulating addresses. Among the statements made by orators, were several clear admissions that the rebellious conspiracy had existed for very many years and that Mr. Lincoln's election was simply the long sought for pretext for rebellion. Two South Carolina politicians were quoted as saying, Most of us have had this matter under consideration for the last 20 years. James A. Inglis. And I have been engaged in this movement ever since I entered political life. Lawrence Keat. Plus, other South Carolinians, such as politician Robert Barnwell Red, lawyer and Confederate Brigadier General Maxi Gregg, as well as a Mr. Parker, made comments about how this was the end of a plan set in motion many years before. The action of the South Carolina legislature in calling an unconditional secession convention acted among the southern states like a spark in a drain of gunpowder. Now we shall see, there was no alternative, the KGC had much power, and war is what they wanted. Alexander H. Stephens, who was from Georgia, spoke out against secession, and argued that the mere election of Lincoln did not matter, as the House of Representatives is largely in the majority against him. In the Senate he will also be powerless. There will be a majority of four against him. In an address issued by Governor McGoffin of Kentucky to the people, he said. To South Carolina and such other states as may wish to secede from the Union, I would say. The geography of this country will not admit of a division, the mouth and sources of the Mississippi River cannot be separated without the horrors of civil war. We cannot sustain you in this movement merely on account of the election of Mr. Lincoln. Kentucky is a border state and has suffered more than all of you. If you secede, your representatives will go out of Congress and leave us at the mercy of a black Republican government. Mr. Lincoln will have no check. He can appoint his cabinet, and have it confirmed. The Congress will then be Republican, and he will be able to pass such laws as he may suggest. The Supreme Court will be powerless to protect us. We implore you to stand by us, and by our friends in the free states. So as we can see, Lincoln was in the minority, and would not have been able to do much, as he would have faced heavy opposition in the House, Senate, and Congress. On December the 20th, 1860, it was declared, We the people of the state of South Carolina in convention assembled do declare and ordain, and it is hereby declared and ordained that the ordinance adopted by us in convention on the 23rd day of May, in the year of our Lord 1788, whereby the Constitution of the United States of America was ratified, and also all acts, and parts of acts, of the General Assembly of this state, ratifying the amendments of the said Constitution, are hereby repealed, and that the Union now subsisting between South Carolina and other states, under the name of the United States of America, is hereby dissolved. After the election of Lincoln the Knights went to their next step, which was to recruit as many Confederate sympathizers as possible. The Knights of the Golden Circle rushed to set up as many castles as they could. These castles were similar to lodges in Freemasonry. Once Lincoln was in office, the KGC's plan was that every man among them who had education enough to read the ritual, was delegated to go forth and organize castles wherever he could find the material to construct one. At this point the agents were to say nothing of the principles of the original establishment of the KGC, that is the re-establishment of the African slave trade and the acquisition of slave territory. It was always represented to outsiders as a strictly anti-submission order only designed to aid in the securing of southern rights. 
new degrees were instituted, which were called preliminary degrees. In these the candidate saw but little of the inner beauties of the castle. The castles of the KGC were divided into the inner and the outer castle. After the preliminary degrees, the initiate reached the inner castle. None but those known to be out and out secessionists were allowed into the Holy of Holies. The inauguration of Lincoln being near at hand, some of the KGC bethought themselves that it would be a fine idea to assassinate him and capture Washington, afford an opportunity to rob the national treasury and thus secure the entire field in advance. I am ashamed to own that there were not a few sneaking devils north of Mason and Dixon's line who counseled this diabolical policy and promised assistance. In 1822, the Roman Catholic monarchies of Europe conspired with the Vatican to destroy the concept of popular government as found in the experiment of the United States by means of infiltration, subversion and corruption. The tools used were the Leopold Foundation, which was set up by Prince Metternich of Austria and the Jesuit Order. And Abraham Lincoln was a major opponent, he was a representation of that popular government. The same Leopold Foundation is a great Jesuit spy system which is not confined to the ecclesiastics of the Roman Church, but embraces every element of society from the private secretary of the president in the White House, to the Catholic servant girl employed in the Protestant American families. Nor, indeed, is it restricted to Roman Catholics, for the Jesuits do not hesitate to use non-Catholic tools whenever it is possible. In fact, they prefer them, for in this way attention is distracted from them. In case of failure it is always preferable to use non-Catholics. John Wilkes Booth became a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle in Baltimore in the fall of 1860, in a residence opposite the cathedral. The following letter is quoted from Booth to a brother Sir Knight. Dear Sir, the KGC had a meeting, I was initiated. The die is cast, and I have crossed the Rubicon and can never return. They tell me that Lincoln will perhaps be inaugurated, but I most heartily wish that never shall sun that morrow see. I am devoted to the South, mind and body, so that she gains her independence. I don't care what becomes of me. If I am sacrificed, I know that my country will grant me immortality. If I escape, so much the better. I can serve her in other ways. One thing is very clear to my mind, the South must take some decisive steps. She must throw a bombshell into the enemy's hand that shall spread terror and consternation wherever it goes. You know what I mean, so don't be surprised. Sincerely yours, John Wilkes Booth. Twenty men had been hired in Baltimore to assassinate the president-elect on his way to Washington. The leader of this band was an Italian refugee, a barber well known in Baltimore. Their plan was as follows, when Mr. Lincoln arrived in that city, the assassins were to mix with the crowd, and get as near as possible, and shoot him with their pistols. If he was in a carriage, hand grenades had been prepared, such as Orsini used in attempting to assassinate Louis Napoleon. The assassins had a vessel lying ready to receive them in the harbor. They were to be carried to Mobile in the seceded state of Alabama. The first Archbishop of Baltimore left his indelible stamp on that diocese, as was clearly demonstrated during the Civil War, for every plot to assassinate President Lincoln, and there were many, was hatched in Baltimore. In fact, Baltimore is the Vienna of America. The assassination plot on Inauguration Day was found out by Alan Pinkerton, a detective from Chicago, working in Baltimore. He relayed the message through Norman B. Judd, a close friend of Lincoln's. The plan was to take a train to Washington earlier than scheduled, but it was a difficult matter at first to convince him of the seriousness of it. He flatly refused to go to Washington immediately, as was suggested by his friends. 
but promised that after he had raised the flag on Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and delivered an address to the members of the legislature at Harrisburg, he would take an earlier train to Washington. The party took the six o'clock train out of Philadelphia, quietly without attracting any publicity, and as Mr. Lincoln was soundly sleeping, the train whizzed through Baltimore and got him to Washington early in the morning, where he was taken in charge by the largest military and secret service escort the president ever had been surrounded with. Thus was the first of Rome's assassination plot thwarted. On March the 4th, 1861, Abraham Lincoln was sworn in as 16th President of the United States. Mr. Lincoln had no idea of the rottenness and treason which were there to face him in Washington. Almost every department in Washington was headed by a traitor to the government. For the arch plotters had been placing their trusted tools preparatory to the final blow. The awakening of the President and the North came on the morning of April the 12th, 1861, with the firing on Fort Sumter. This opening shot of the rebellion was sent by General Beauregard, Jesuit leader of the military operations. Beauregard was a professed Romanist and sprung from a distinguished family of Jesuits. It was G.T. Beauregard, a rabid Roman Catholic, who first fired on the flag of our country at Fort Sumter, and let loose the dogs of war. It was the Pope of Rome, and he alone, of all the European potentates, who gave his recognition and his blessing to the Confederate government, and by the very terms of his kind letter to its president, made it manifest that he expected, to secure its recognition of his claims, and win it for the church. Pope Pius IX, wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis, and acknowledged him as the, Honorable President of the Confederate States of America. This letter of the Pope to Jefferson Davis, coached in such courteous and loving terms, and showing so clearly that his sympathy was with the Southern cause, was well understood by his loyal and faithful subjects all over the North. Roman Catholic officers began to resign and the rank and file began to desert. From the time of the publication of that letter in 1863, to the close of the war, it was the Pope of Rome, and his faithful Lieutenant, Louis Napoleon, who, taking advantage of our civil war, undertook to establish a Roman Catholic Empire in Mexico, and for this purpose sent Maximilian, a Roman Catholic prince, under the protection of a French army, to usurp dominion, and take possession of the country. All of this was done in hope that the Union cause would be lost, and that through the strife that she had fomented, two Roman Catholic empires would be established on the American continent, that of Mexico under Maximilian, and that of the Confederacy under Jefferson Davis, thus making it possible to make a conquest of the entire continent. It wasn't just Lincoln that was targeted for assassination, the plan was to eliminate Secretary of State William H. Seward, and Vice President Andrew Johnson, along with Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, and General Ulysses S. Grant. The object of this scheme of wholesale assassinations of civil and military heads of government, was to throw the country into a state of chaos, and thus retrieve the fast-failing fortunes of the Confederacy. The scheme to aid the rebellion by the assassination of the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of War, and the General in Command of our armies, was concocted by the emissaries of the rebel government, who kept their headquarters in Montreal, Canada. These emissaries, held a semi-official relation to the Confederate government. The whole run of the evidence makes it clear, that the Roman hierarchy kept itself in close relations with these emissaries. That the assassination plot was known to the Bishop of Montreal, and a number of his priests, before its accomplishment, and received their sanction, was made plain by their subsequent conduct. As soon as the news of the assassination of the President was flashed over the wires, Fathers Boucher and LaPierre kept themselves on the lookout, 
and ready to aid any of the conspirators who might make good their escape to Canada. It kept itself in these close relations for a purpose, and was most likely the original source of the inspiration of the assassination plot. These rebel emissaries were Jacob Thompson of Mississippi, Clement C. Clay of Alabama, and Beverly Tucker of Virginia. These had associated with them as helpers George N. Sanders, Dr. Blackburn, and others, men who preferred to fight in the field of political strategy rather than on the field of battle. These agents of the rebel government entered into a contract with J. Wilkes Booth and John H. Surratt to carry out their scheme and also aided them in the selection of their subordinates. The headquarters of the conspiracy in Washington City was the house of a Roman Catholic family of which Mrs. Mary Easterrot was the head and that all of its inmates, including a number of boarders, were devoted members of the Roman Catholic Church. This house was the meeting place, the council chamber of Booth and his conspirators, including Mrs. Mary Easterrot and her son, John H. Surratt, who, next to Booth, were the most active members of the conspiracy in preparation for the execution of the plot. When John Surratt was 12 years old, he attended Gonzaga College, Washington, D.C., a Catholic preparatory school, under the tutorage of Priest Widget, a school that fellow conspirator David Herold attended as well. After leaving Gonzaga College, he spent two years at Georgetown in the Jesuit College before leaving for the Sulpician Fathers Monastery. At the time John H. Surratt attended the Sulpician Monastery it was called St. Charles College. He was there until the start of the Civil War. He had commenced a collegiate course, having the priesthood in view. His sympathies were so strongly with the South that he left the college, gave up his priestly aspirations, and engaged actively in the secret service of the Confederate government. As a student, he was very popular, and seemed to have won the favor of the president and the faculty. While at St. Charles, John Surratt befriended L.J. Weichmann. Through this friendship, Louis J. Weichmann became a boarder at John Surratt's mother's house. L.J. Weichmann became an important witness, and through his testimony it was learned that Booth's business there was always with John H. Surratt, and in his absence with his mother, and that it was always strictly private and confidential in its character. In his private journal and diary, John H. Surratt wrote of his initiation into the Knights of the Golden Circle, in Baltimore, in July of 1860. Arise and follow, if you would be made acquainted with the secrets of the Knights of the Golden Circle. John Surratt was standing outside Ford's Theatre on the night of the assassination, calling the time three times in succession at short intervals, the last time calling, ten minutes past ten, and walking rapidly away, did not return. Lincoln was shot at about 10.15 p.m. Surratt told an acquaintance that, he left Washington early on the morning of the 15th of April, disguised as an English tourist, and that he had a very hard time making his escape. As the trains leaving Washington for Baltimore, were thoroughly scrutinized by the police before being permitted to leave, it is unclear whether Surratt's disguise sufficed to get him through, or whether he went part or all the way to Baltimore on horseback. The next place we get track of him in his flight is at the railroad depot at Burlington, Vermont, on the early morning of the 18th of April. They had crossed Lake Champlain on a boat, the tram from Whitehall to Rouses Point, on the night of the 17th, and landed at Burlington, in order to take the train to Montreal. From Burlington, Surratt went to Essex Junction, Vermont, to change trains to St. Albans, Vermont. This was on the early morning of the 18th of April. They arrived at St. Albans for breakfast. When he got to Montreal, Sir Rot was, at once spirited away, to the house of a Mr. Porterfield. This man was a southerner, who belonged to Thompson's cabal. 
but who had abjured his allegiance to his country and taken the oath of allegiance to the Queen of England. He at once took Sir Rot into his house and kept him secreted there for several days. Finding the detectives who were in pursuit of the fugitive vigilant and determined in their search, Porterfield became fearful that he could not keep his charge concealed, and so made arrangements to get him into a place of greater security. Porterfield had arranged with Father Boucher to take his charge in custody, and keep him concealed. This father was rector of the parish of St. Libois, a newly settled place, about 45 miles from Montreal, an out-of-the-way place. Father Boucher appeared at the trial of Zerot as a voluntary witness for the defense and without any apparent sense of shame, convicted himself, by his own testimony, of being an accomplice after the fact. We think that the testimony he gave warrants the conclusion, also, that another priest, Father Larbier, placed himself in the same category. Both of these fathers took Sarot into their houses and kept him concealed, the first for three and the latter for two months, knowing him to be charged with being a conspirator to the assassination of the President of the United States. La Pierre aided Sarot from the latter part of July until the 5th of September, 1865. Early in September, Father LaPierre sought an interview with Dr. Louis J. A. McMillan, surgeon on board the ocean steamer, Peruvian, which was to sail on the 16th of that month from Quebec for Liverpool, and made arrangements to put in his care for the passage a friend of his, by the name of McCarthy, who, for certain reasons, desired to embark secretly on the voyage. Boucher and LaPierre conveyed Sirot in a covered carriage and went with him on board the same steamer on which the doctor had taken passage. LaPierre was in disguise, inasmuch as he was dressed in citizen's dress. They had also disguised Sirot by coloring his hair, painting his face, and putting spectacles over his eyes. John H. Sirot took the ocean steamer, Peruvian, under the alias of McCarthy, from Quebec to Liverpool, England. Sarot is next found in Italy, in the army of the Pope, where he had enlisted as a soldier in the 9th Company of Zouaves about the middle of April, 1866. He had found friends after his escape from Washington, who had supported him, kept him secreted, watched over his safety, planned his trip from Montreal to Italy, and furnished him money for the expenses of his journey, friends who, no doubt, were accomplices before, as well as after, the fact. An old friend of Sirot's who was in the same company of the Papal Suaves, comes in contact with him and alerts the American Consul. The American Consul was informed of his whereabouts, and upon the matter being brought to the notice of the Pope, through Cardinal Antonelli, an order was issued for his arrest and delivery to the United States authorities. He was thus arrested by his comrades in the service, and kept under guard. But succeeded in making his escape from his guards, if we may believe the story, by making a bold dash down a precipice, at the risk of his life. Having thus escaped, he made his way to Naples, and thence to Alexandria, in Egypt. Sarot was arrested in Alexandria, Egypt, on the 27th of November, 1866. He was put in chains, placed on board the United States man of war ship, Swatara, and brought back to Washington, where he was held to answer for his crime. From the very moment the Swatara reached this country, with John H. Surratt, bound hand and foot on board, all the wheels of the Roman Catholic political machine were set in motion for his certain release. The first panel of jurors was illegally drawn, it was brought to the attention of the court, that, the names had been drawn, not by the clerk of the circuit court, but by the clerk of the city of Georgetown. It is a notable fact, that there were 16 Romanists out of the 26, in the first panel drawn in that irregular manner. Georgetown, Jesuitized Georgetown, was constantly in evidence at the trial. 
the priests from the Jesuit college were there, and the students who were just dismissed for their vacations, were on hand and would always make it a particular point to greet Sirot, who had been a student at that institution for two years, most cordially, and he was scarcely ever without a priest at his side. From the very beginning, duplicity and innuendo were used, and unprofessional conduct of the most flagrant character was resorted to. The state's witnesses were badgered, abused and bulldozed. So much so, that the judge had to interfere more than once. The hearing began June 17, 1867, and closed July 26, 1867. The arguments of the attorneys covered 12 days. The case went to the jury August 7, three days later, the jury brought in a report, that they stood about even for conviction and acquittal, with no prospect of reaching an agreement Sarot was remanded to jail. He was then indicted on the charge of engaging in rebellion. He was admitted to bail on this charge in the amount of $20,000. A second indictment was found against him, but the district attorney entered an orly prosque on this. The prisoner was finally released and permitted to go free on a technicality. Booth, the ringleader, was born and reared a Protestant. He was only a nominal Protestant however. He was a man of the world, a drunkard and a libertine, and utterly indifferent to matters of religion. But under the influence of his associations in the conspiracy plot, he had become a convert to Catholicism, was shown, by the fact that, on examination of his person after his death, it was found that he was wearing a Catholic medal under his vest. The wily Jesuit, sympathizing with him in his political views, and in hope of destroying our government, and establishing the Confederacy, which had already received the Pope's recognition, and expressions of goodwill and sympathy conferred upon it, had been able to convert him to Catholicism. As was stated earlier, Booth was initiated into the KGC, in the fall of 1860. Edward Spangler, was an employee at Ford's Theatre, who Booth recruited to help him with various preparations at the theatre, for the night of the assassination. On the night of the assassination, Spangler, had a boy named Joseph Peanuts Burroughs, a helper at the theater, hold Booth's horse, while Booth carried out the assassination. Immediately after Booth shot Lincoln and jumped from the presidential box, Spangler had faithfully redeemed his promise to render him all the aid he could by keeping the passage to the door clear at the critical moment and also by doing all he could to retard pursuit. When a fellow employee cried out, that was Booth. Ned ordered him to shut up, saying, you don't know who it was. A man by the name of Stewart, chased Booth into the alley, and testified that he saw Spangler, or someone resembling him by the door, and that he could have prevented Booth's exit, had he been so disposed. From Ford's theater, Booth fled to southern Maryland where he met up with Davy Herold, somewhere on the road to Surratsville, Maryland. Booth and Herold then stopped by John Lloyd's tavern, and picked up two carbines, Booth's field glasses, and whiskey. These items were left there previously for this very occasion. At Mrs. Surratt's trial the owner of Lloyd's tavern, John Lloyd testified that, a couple weeks before the assassination, John Surratt, George H. Surratt, and David Herold arrived at his tavern and told him to hide two carbines, with ammunition, also a rope 16 feet in length, and a monkey wrench. Lloyd also stated to the court that, on the Tuesday before the assassination, Mary Surratt and Louis J. Weichmann visited him, she told me to have those shooting irons ready that night, there would be some parties who would call for them. She gave me something wrapped in a piece of paper, which I took upstairs, and found to be a field glass. She told me to get two bottles of whiskey ready, and that these things were to be called for that night. From Lloyd's Tavern, the next herd of them was at the house of Dr. Samuel A. Mudd, near Bryant Town, in Maryland, and about 30 miles from Washington, where they arrived at about 4 o'clock on the morning of the 15th. 
after seeing a squad of soldiers under Lieutenant Dana passing down past Mudd's place, Dr. Mudd decided to forward Booth and Herald to their next stop on their escape route. Mudd got rid of his dangerous charge by sending them by an unfrequented route to the house of his friend and neighbor, Samuel Cox, about six miles nearer to the Potomac. Cox lived near Port Tobacco, the home of Adzirot, and as his was too public a place to afford safety to the fugitives, he turned them over to his neighbor, Thomas Jones, a contraband trader between Maryland and Richmond, who, in the midst of a constant scouring of the country by pursuing parties, kept his charge concealed in the woods near his house, supplying them with food and doing everything he could for their comfort, waiting and watching constantly to find an opportunity to get them across the Potomac. The river was being continually patrolled by gunboats, and the task of getting his wards across proved both difficult and dangerous to Jones. Finally, being furnished by Jones with a boat, they took their own risks and effected a crossing, but they were seen by a man, upon whose report General Baker got on their track, and finally effected their capture. Booth and Herald crossed into Virginia, Booth thinking he will be received as a hero there, but Booth was greatly disappointed at the cold reception given him by the people on whom he had counted so much after crossing into Virginia. He had expected to be lionized and honored as the hero of the age, but instead of that he received a comparatively cold reception that stung his vanity like the poison of an ass. It is true the people showed no disposition to betray him, but, at the same time, they manifested a disposition to enter into no compromising friendship with him. Booth and Herald made their way to Port Conway on the Rappahannock, in King George County, Virginia. It is just at this juncture that they are met by three Confederate soldiers, Major Ruggles, Lieutenant Banbridge, and Captain William Jett. Herald thinking they were recruiting for the rebel service, was quick to see in them a means of assistance in getting south, and so revealed their identity, appealing to them for assistance. Major Ruggles placed Booth on his horse when the whole party crossed over the Rappahannock from Port Conway in King George to Port Royal in Caroline County, Virginia and after an ineffectual effort to find quarters for Boog in the town they took him three miles on the road to Bowling Green, where they succeeded in getting a man by the name of Garrett to take him in, with the understanding that he would do all he could for his comfort and safety. Garrett took Boog and Herald in, with a full knowledge of all the facts in the case, and with some manifest reluctance from a knowledge of the danger he would thus incur. From Garrett's farm, Captain William Jepp went back to Bowling Green, where he stayed at Goldman's Hotel. A Colonel Conger, through his investigations, found Captain Jepp and informed him that he was cognizant of his movements for the last two days, and that if he did not tell him the truth, he would hang him. Jet was greatly excited and told him that he had left Booth at the Garrett Farm, three miles from Port Royal. The colonel then had Jet's horse taken from the stable, making Jet his unwilling guide to the place of Booth's concealment. They were ordered to come out and surrender themselves, which Booth refused to do. After a considerable parley, Harold came to the door and gave himself up. Booth still refusing to surrender, a wisp of hay was fired, and thrown in on the hay in the barn. The hay illuminated the barn, and Booth was seen with his garbine. At this moment, Sergeant Boston Corbett of the 16th New York Cavalry fired at Booth through a crack in the barn, upon his own responsibility, and struck him on the back part of his head, very nearly in the same part where his own ball had struck the President. With the coming of the morning of the 26th of April, 1865, 12 days after the commission of his crime and commencement of his flight, the malefactor expired. After the death of Booth, he was found to be wearing a Catholic Agnus Dei medal. The significance of this medal is, the translation of Agnus Dei, is, Lamb of God, it indicates sacrifice, the shedding of blood. 
the writer, is informed by an ex-Romanist, who examined the medal, that it was made in Rome, probably sent directly from the Pope. Edward Spangler, the employee at Ford's Theatre, was arrested on April the 17th, charged with being an accomplice to John Wilkes Booth. Spangler was found guilty, and sentenced to six years at Fort Jefferson, in the Dry Tartugas, 70 miles off Key West, Florida. At about the age of 14, Samuel Mudd attended St. John's Roman Catholic boarding school in Frederick City, Maryland. Two years later he enrolled in Jesuit Georgetown University, where he completed his collegiate course. Dr. Samuel Mudd, with his contacts, was more than likely a knight of the Golden Circle, as it was known, that he met with Booth, and other knights, in the middle of November, 1864, at St. Mary's Church, in Bryant Town, Maryland. There is no doubt, that all the conspirators were members of the Knights of the Golden Circle. Samuel Mudd's house was on the escape route, and helped Booth and Herald the night of the assassination. David Herald was born in Maryland, he grew up in a house near the Washington Navy Yard. He attended Jesuit Gonzaga College High School, and Jesuit Georgetown University. Herald became friends with John Surratt, who also attended Gonzaga College High School, and Georgetown University. It is likely that Booth recruited Herald, in the assassination plot because of his extensive knowledge of Southern Maryland. Davy Herald was assigned to guide Lewis Powell to the Secretary of State William Seward's home, so Powell could assassinate him. Powell's attempt faced complications, and screams were heard from the Secretary's house. So, Herald left Seward's house, leaving Powell there, and met up with Booth after the assassination of Lincoln. Somewhere on the road to Surrattsville, Maryland, David Herald gave up and turned himself in at Garrett's farm without a fight. He was convicted for his role in the conspiracy, and hung on July 7, 1865, at Fort McNair, Washington, D.C. Dr. Samuel Mudd was arrested and charged with conspiracy to murder President Lincoln. On June 29, 1865, Mudd was found guilty, he was imprisoned at Fort Jefferson, along with Edward Spangler. Michael O'Laughlin, was a boyhood friend of Booth's from Baltimore, who grew up on the same street as Booth. Samuel Arnold was born in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., and moved to Baltimore where he attended the same military academy as Booth and O'Laughlin. It was Michael O'Laughlin's job to assassinate General Ulysses S. Grant, as he was going to attend Ford's Theater, with his wife and the Lincolns. But, the Grants had to change their plans, as their daughter was sick, and did not attend. Had not the General been called away on that Friday afternoon, had he accompanied the President to the theater, as he intended doing? Arrangements would have been made for General Grant's assassination, that would have made O'Laughlin a companion of Booth in his flight. Samuel Arnold attended a meeting in late March, 1865, with Booth, Surratt, O'Laughlin, H. Surratt, and a man with the alias of Mose By. At this meeting Samuel Arnold said, he told Booth then, that if the thing did not take place that week, he would withdraw. Booth got angry at that, and said he ought to be shot for talking in that way. He said that he replied to Booth, who two could play at that game, and that he withdrew from the conspiracy at that time. Sam Arnold found employment at Fortress Monroe and was there at the time of the assassination. But because of the letter written to Booth from Arnold, in which he showed his enthusiasm and willingness to complete the assassination plan, he was charged and found guilty. None, no, not one, were more in favor of the enterprise than myself. Samuel Arnold was arrested on suspicion of complicity based on testimony from Lewis J. Weichmann. O'Laughlin voluntarily surrendered on Monday, April the 17th, 1865. He was sentenced to life. 
Arnold was sentenced to life in prison at Fort Jefferson, along with Samuel Mudd and O'Laughlin. Arnold was pardoned with Mudd by Andrew Johnson in 1869 and released. O'Laughlin died at Fort Jefferson, where he contracted yellow fever on September 19, 1867, and died four days later. Lewis Thornton Powell, also known as Lewis Payne, was born in Randolph County, Alabama. His family moved to Florida in Powell's teen years, where he joined the Confederate Army. Not much is known about Lewis Powell. As far as it is known, he was the son of a Protestant minister. He refused to tell anything about himself, but when he went to his death, he was courageous to a degree that astonished the newspaper correspondents and other spectators. Official records show Powell joined for duty and enrolled in the Confederate Army on June 4, 1861, in Jasper, Hamilton County, Florida. On the night of the assassination, it was Powell's job to eliminate Secretary of State William Seward. At about the same time that Booth entered Ford's theater, Payne and Herald rode to Secretary Seward's residence on Madison Place. Secretary Seward was in bed with a broken arm and fracture a jaw, the result of a runaway carriage. Leaving Herald to hold his horse, Payne rang the bell. He held a small package in his hand and told the boy who opened the door that Dr. Verdi, Mr. Seward's attending physician, had sent him to give some medicine to the secretary. Despite the boy's objections, Payne pushed past him and walked noisily up the two flights of stairs. His heavy tread had attracted the attention of Frederick Seward, the assistant secretary of state, and he met the intruder near the door of the sick room. On Payne's continuing to insist that the doctor's orders were that he should see the secretary, Mr. Seward finally said, it is not worthwhile to talk any longer about it, you cannot see Mr. Seward. I will take the responsibility of refusing to let you see him. Go back and tell the doctor if you think you cannot entrust me with the medicine. I am Mr. Seward and in charge here, he will not blame you if you tell him I refuse to let you see him. After a moment's hesitation Payne said, Very well, sir. I will go, and turned as if to go downstairs. But at the top step he suddenly turned and struck Frederick Seward on the head with his heavy pistol, with such force as to break the cartridge extractor. Mr. Seward struggled with his assailant until he fell to the floor in a swoon, from which he did not recover for many days. Fanny Seward William Seward's daughter and Sergeant George F. Robinson, the secretary's nurse were present in the room when Powell entered. Robinson opened the door. Instantly Payne felled him with a blow on his forehead from his knife, and pushing Miss Seward aside as she approached him, threw himself on the secretary's bed and stabbed him three times, once on the right cheek and twice in the neck. Robinson recovering himself jumped upon the bed and threw his arms around Payne, succeeding after a severe struggle in dragging him off. Robinson's struggle with the assassin was now continued on the floor and he received three severe wounds before he was able, with the assistance of Major Augustus Seward, a younger son, who had entered the room to force Payne into the hall. Here he again knocked Robinson down, and extricating himself from Major Seward, rushed downstairs. Overtaking and stabbing Mr. Hansel, a messenger of the State Department, who was seeking help. At the cry of murder, from an upper window Herald left Paint's horse, and mounting his own, fled down Pennsylvania Avenue to 14th Street. Payne had been instructed by Booth to meet him beyond the Anacostia Bridge, but Payne was not familiar with the city, and had depended upon Herald as a guide, so, he now rode out Vermont Avenue to the eastern suburb. Losing his way, and fearing that his appearance would excite suspicion, he abandoned his horse, which was found loose next morning at Lincoln Branch Barracks about three quarters of a mile east of the capital, and took refuge in the woods. For three days and nights he remained in hiding, and then returned to the house on H Street, 
which have been the headquarters of the conspiracy. On the night that Powell went back to the Sarot house, the police were already there, and had Mary Sarot, her daughter, and Honor of Fitzpatrick, under arrest. Whilst they were waiting for a conveyance at near the hour of midnight, the assassin Payne rang the doorbell, and was taken in, and placed under arrest by the officer in charge. When Mrs. Surratt was confronted by Payne she held up her hand and solemnly said, Before God I do not know him, and never saw him. It will be remembered that he had within the last three weeks, to that time, stayed in her house for three days and nights. He could, under the circumstances in which he was placed, only have given this confidence to a co-conspirator. Powell was found guilty, and hung on July 7, 1865. George H. Seerdt was born in Germany in 1835, he immigrated to the United States with his family in 1843, at the age of eight. They settled in Maryland. During the Civil War, Aitzirad obtained extra money by helping Confederate agents to cross the Potomac River. Booth had arranged with him, and relied on him, to assassinate the Vice President. For this purpose he had removed him from the Pennsylvania to the Kirkwood House, where the Vice President was boarding. This change had been made on the morning of the 14th, and Booth had been there during the day to see that all things were properly arranged. To aid Sirat, it fell to assassinate Vice President Johnson, but he became frightened and spent the day riding into the country, on a horse from the livery barn in Washington, where he was found several days after, with relatives of his below Washington. He made a written confession before he was executed, which confirmed the presence of Sir Rot in Washington that day, a fact which nine reputable witnesses had sworn to. Aitzirat had asked the bartender at the Kirkwood House the whereabouts of Johnson, which aroused a suspicion the next day, after Lincoln was assassinated. Aitzirat's room was searched, and a bank book belonging to Booth was found. Booth had mistaken his man, but being a member of the conspiracy, he was equally guilty with Booth. George Aitzirat was found guilty, and hung with Mary Surratt. David Herold, and Lewis Powell, on July 7, 1865.